Hi, I'm Dr. Nick Delgado with Simply Healthy TV. I'm uh, fortunate to interview Dr. Terry Grossman, preventative medicine specialist, anti-aging doctor, and we're going to start off with the topic of estrogen metabolism and its impact on both women and men. So, Dr. Grossman, what is it that you're using in your practice, and is it true, have you heard this fact, that not only the xenoestrogens, the pesticides, the cosmetics, the fire retardant in the beds, but the sources of bottled water, uh, even fish has PCBs that are estrogen-like mimics. Now we're finding out that meat, chicken, fish, turkey, these are very highly hormonal animals, even if you don't inject them with hormones. So we might get almost 10,000 times more estrogen in our body exposure than at any time in history. Is, is that a probable fact? And what do you do about this? And what are the side effects of all that estrogen? I think you'll agree with me. Optimal levels, we measure like 20 to 30, say. Correct. And if we can keep our estradiol levels in that in range. In the blood. In the, in the blood, blood levels. I think that, you know, estradiol does have value for men. I think it has bone effects. I think it has memory effects. I think it helps calm us down. I think it, it really does have some good effects. But so many men have levels 50, 70, 100, and higher. This is a risk factor for the epidemic of prostate cancer in men and estrogen dominance in women. I mean, I think women who have a lot of estrogen that's not mellowed out by other hormones like testosterone or progesterone where they're estrogen dominant, that's why we're seeing this epidemic of breast cancer in women. So I think that this we're, we're swimming in a world of estrogen from many sources and I think it really creates a lot of problems for us. And the two biggest hormone related cancers breast cancer in women and prostate cancer in men is really can be laid at the feet of estrogen dominance. Yes, and there are some scientists that suggest that estrogen uh, and its harmful metabolites sometimes plays a role in almost all types of cancer. We're not just limiting it to just the what we normally call the estrogen dominant cancers, the uh, prostate and breast. So with that understanding, what approaches can we take to detoxify, literally help these estrogens, these harmful estrogen metabolites, to go through their pathways and excrete out the body into safer forms? Well, I think anything that we can do to cause detoxification makes sense. So, you know, these type of metabolites come out in sweat. So when we exercise, we sweat them out. When we go into uh, the far infrared sauna, we sweat intensely, we get rid of these things. We obviously want to avoid the ingestion in the first place. So drinking water from glass bottles instead of these plastic bottles, uh, avoiding conventional chicken and things like that, avoiding all the plastic wraps in our foods is, you know, obviously it's impossible to do that completely, but to the degree that we can do, I think it's beneficial. And then, you know, using, uh, you know, supplements, I think can be valuable. What are your favorite supplements and herbs that you've seen target estrogen dominance and help to resolve or reduce the risk of these problems related to estrogen dominance? Well, it's actually pretty complicated. Estrogen isn't just estrogen. We have 2-hydroxy and 16-hydroxy and 4, you know, all of these uh, metabolites. So there's quite probably more than 40 different estrogen metabolites. Yeah, yeah, it's actually pretty complicated more than I understand, but the few that I do understand, the bottom line is I think we can beneficially affect their metabolism with cruciferous vegetables. So I think Brussels sprouts are everybody's friends. I eat Brussels sprouts every chance I can get. I put it in my juice in the morning and things like that. I think these cruciferous vegetables are very, very beneficial, uh, particularly the brassica family. Um, but then you have uh, certain supplements, like uh, the first one was I3C, endol 3 carbonyl, and then a cousin of that, DIM, DIM, methane. I think these are very, very beneficial in changing the balance of estrogen, both lowering the levels and changing it from the toxic forms to the less toxic forms. Yeah, Dr. Edwin Lee, endocrinologist, states that he uses DIM and he, like pouring water. He uses it consistently with all of his patients. And of course, there was originally a debate, is IC3, indyl 3 carbonyl better, or is DIM, methane better? And we looked at the it and The answer is both. Both, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I yes, like that. yes, the answer. So, so take both of them. <laughs> right. And so when you're looking at that, uh, once you detoxify the, say, 16 or the bad uh, hydroxyesterone to the good 2-hydroxyesterone, 
there's still more pathways to usher it through, uh, methyl groups, uh, right. correct? Right, right, right. And, and now that we're beginning to do genomics testing on patients and looking at this COMT uh, pathway and the other, you know, it's, it's actually pretty complicated. We don't understand it fully, but we're getting a better idea. But we can look at the bottom line and we can come up with effective detox strategies that people can utilize. Because I think that we really need to reduce the, the sea of estrogen we're swimming in. Dr. Grossman, <clears throat> I, I'm going to put out a, and challenge a, a therapy that's been used uh, for quite a while now. Apparently, urologists feel that the DHT and the testosterone is the bad guy, so they'll obliterate or remove particularly the DHT and androgens, and then they'll actually give hormonal estrogens to men. So when you've heard Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler of uh, Testosterone for Life and Terry Hertog and Ron Rothenberg, UC San Diego professor, these individuals are looking at a, a newer set of research and going back through all the literature and we're starting to recognize what you had mentioned. How does estrogen relate to prostate cancer and prostate enlargement? And why would you even give estrogen to a patient who has already a problem with estrogen dominance? Yeah, this is a complicated issue, but uh, there was actually, he wasn't even a physician, he was a mathematician from the University of Chicago, University of Chicago a guy by the name of Ed Friedman. And he wrote uh, a book in the last couple of years called The New Testosterone Cure. And in this book, he points out that the factors that initiate breast cancer and the factors that initiate prostate cancer are radically different than the factors that cause these diseases to grow. So for instance, in men, we know that for years and years and years, testosterone was poison. We really needed to stay away from it because it causes prostate cancer. And this was based upon flawed thinking because we do know that testosterone can help prostate cancer grow in a man that already has it. But to initiate prostate cancer, it does not do that. Who has more prostate cancer? Obviously, is it younger men or older men? Younger men with high testosterone do not, and older men with low testosterone do, and they actually have higher estrogen levels. As you exactly. So the, the scenario of a young man, high testosterone, low estrogen, no prostate cancer. Old man, low estrogen, high, uh, low testosterone, high estrogen, more prostate cancer. So this really is the setup. So if we can keep in the, in the, for men, the testosterone levels elevated or not necessarily to high, but levels. good, youthful levels and estradiol levels at healthy levels like we talked about, 20 to 30 in the blood. I think this is a milieu where men can be most protected against prostate cancer and stay youthful for a long period of time. Similarly, we want to do things with women to keep their levels in a healthful level because we know that Estradiol doesn't necessarily cause uh, breast cancer in a woman, but if she has breast cancer, particularly the hormone receptor positive types, it will help it to grow. So it's a complicated situation, and we need to, when, when people are on hormone therapy, do regular monitoring. But as a general rule, I feel that, you know, what can testosterone do? It can go down one pathway and turn into estradiol and it does that with the enzyme aromatase. And we can affect uh, the activity of that aromatase with high doses of zinc, you know, and, and I3C and DIM like we talked about earlier, but it can also go in another direction. Testosterone can form dihydrotestosterone, DHT. DHT can cause acne, it can cause male pattern baldness, prostate growth, maybe even a risk factor for prostate cancer. So I think that we need to look both in men and women at that pathway, and, and that enzyme is 5-alpha reductase, and that can be affected by things like um, beta pro, uh, cytosterol. I'm glad you mentioned that, because we use a product called DHT block, and one of the principal ingredients is beta cytosterol. So yeah. tell us about that. Well, beta cytosterol will be a 5-alpha reductase blocker, so the pathway from testosterone to the very active testosterone, DHT. And there are advantages to DHT, but too much DHT is not a good thing at all. Somewhere around 40 or so is probably Right, and I, I don't know what you use, but in my clinic I say 75 is the upper limit. 
Yeah. You know, 50 to 75. Anybody over that, I want to bring it down. Is and, it a one to three ratio to testosterone generally as well? I mean, some people feel that uh, anything above that, you know, it doesn't make sense. That the ratios of hormones are very important, aren't they? I think the ratios are important. And if you do have a relative uh, higher amount of DHT, dihydrotestosterone, you know, the first thing we want to look at is the beta cytosterol, the saw palmetto products, things like that. Mm -hmm. I think they can help. They don't always help, and if they don't help, luckily we have the, uh, the 5 alpha reductase blocker drugs. And I think where a man will take uh, finasteride or dutasteride, they'll typically take one or five milligrams a day for various conditions. You can give them like one milligram a couple times a week, and that'll effectively, very, very low doses, can block that pathway so that you keep testosterone high and DHT at a healthy level as well. That makes sense.